Father, we ask that uh, as we look at this part of your word, uh, that you would focus our hearts and our minds, uh, that we would learn from your word, that we would grow in our knowledge and understanding of you, and please grow us in our love of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a kid, uh, our neighbours on one side were this uh, lovely uh, family originally from Hong Kong, five kids and mum and dad. Dad was a restaurateur. He ran a Chinese restaurant and it was good. It was really, really good. Um, they would occasionally invite us over for meals and so we got to, you know, in a sense, sample the produce before it went out onto the, the table. Um, but one of the things that I remember uh, as a kid was um, there, uh, the children in the family were older than me and they eventually got married. And we got invited to the weddings and the weddings were, you know, fairly simple affairs. But the receptions, let me tell you, wow. I remember one of the uh, receptions that we went to the courses just kept coming, one after the other, and it was absolutely fabulous. And I remember once looking across the table as yet another course was brought out, and my dad turning to the waiter and just going, more? <laughs> and it's like, yes, and that was only course number six of a 12-course banquet. Can you imagine? It was so great. It was so good. <laughs> and we weren't even paying for it. We had all this free food. It was festive. It was great. We had this absolute smorgasbord coming at us from all directions. It was fantastic. Well, here in the passage that uh, Ming read for us in John chapter 1, John tells us that in Jesus the divine eternal word, we have a smorgasbord of grace that is brought to us. We get grace after grace after grace and it just keeps coming. If you have a look at uh, verse 16 there, uh, so John says that in verse 14 we have received grace uh, um, and truth in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, uh, John writes, out of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Uh, the NIV uh, 11 says, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Now, as much as I hate to critique the NIV, which I love as a translation, and my beloved colleague, Andrew Sheed, is on the translation committee, um, I can see why they've translated the Greek in this way, grace uh, in place of grace already given or grace instead of grace is the idea. Um, it seems to suggest that there's already some grace there and so along comes Jesus and now there's new grace that either replaces the old grace or gets piled on top of the old grace or, you know, something like that. Um, and the expression, the way that it says it in the Greek is a little bit awkward so I can understand why the translators reach for something that is a little bit awkward in the way that they say it. But I think what we've got here in uh, verse 16 is John, who is thinking in Aramaic, his own native language, but obviously he's writing in Greek. So his brain's working in Aramaic, but the hand is working in Greek. Uh, there's an Aramaic expression behind it. And I think what he's trying to say is, we have all received just grace after grace. One grace after another. Now, notice that he says it's out of his fullness. Well, first of all, whose fullness are we talking about? Um, just before verse 16 in verse 15, John the writer talks about John the Baptist uh, and gives a very brief uh, intro about John's testimony and then a few sentences later he goes into what John's testimony is. Uh, we're not going to get into John the Baptist's testimony, I'll save that for next week, um, but he's not talking about John the Baptist's fullness, okay, even though John is the one who's immediately mentioned beforehand. He's talking, of course, 
about the divine, eternal word. That is, he's talking about the Lord Jesus. What is this fullness? What is this fullness from which uh, we have benefited? Well, in um, ancient times, there was a a group called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics uh, claimed to have uh, Christian roots and they uh, basically argued that they had access to this really special secret knowledge. And to really be a Christian, you had to have access to this special knowledge. And they believed that they had access to this fullness. That's what they called this special knowledge. This, they believed it was kind of like this energy, this kind of spiritual energy that came from God. It was kind of mystical and it was all just a little bit, ooh. <laughs> John is not saying that that's what the fullness is. Quite simply, if you go back to verse 14, we see what the fullness is. The word, the divine and eternal word is full of grace and truth. When John stands back and he looks at Jesus, what is it that he sees? Grace and truth. It's like, John, it's like you know, standing on the edge of a cliff looking out over the ocean in its, in, you know, in all its vastness and saying, well, what is this ocean full of? Water. (laughs) It's just full of water. When John beholds Jesus, he sees someone who is full of grace and truth. And we must remember that the divine and eternal word came to us in flesh. John is making this astounding claim, not about some spiritual entity or some angel or something like that. He's talking about the man whom he knew, the man whom he followed, Jesus of Nazareth, the one who grew up in first century Palestine, who learnt carpentry as a trade and then called people to repent. John looks at this man and sees his entire life abounding, overflowing with a vastness of grace and truth. And he's not exaggerating. Notice that John also says, we have all received grace upon grace. I think as a tendency, we often will read ourselves into the scriptures. And so whenever we see the word we, we kind of automatically associate that with us. You know, we see ourselves in there. Uh, Or sometimes if a writer says you, well, obviously that must be speaking about me. But we've got to be a little bit more discerning than that. What is it that John's talking about here? Who is he talking about? Who is the we who have received grace after grace? Well, because he says we all have received grace upon grace, it means that there could be a smaller group than we all, a more restrictive smaller group. We, but not all of us. And I think that helps to explain what John will go on to say in verse 17. In verse 17, he says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And notice how he starts verse 17 with that word, for. There's a connection here between what we have all received... And then what he describes in verse 17. The law given through Moses, grace and and truth coming through Jesus Christ. The law was given to Israel. The law wasn't given to Gentiles. wasn't given to anyone outside of the nation of Israel. 
It was given exclusively to the nation of Israel so that only the nation of Israel could say that they were the people of God. Yahweh was the God of Israel who brought Israel out of Egypt. He was their God. They were his people. But John here says that we all have received grace. Grace and truth have come to Jew and Gentile alike. Throughout John, uh, Jesus is acting in a Jewish setting. He's coming to the nation of Israel and he's calling the nation of Israel uh, to repent. He's relating within God's own covenant people as one of them. He himself is a Jew. And every now and then, as we keep reading through John's Gospel, we hear Jesus talking about the hour that is to come, his hour, the hour that is to come. And it's very interesting that that hour doesn't actually come until John chapter 12, just after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he rides into Jerusalem and he's there in Jerusalem and crowds are flocking to him to see this man whom everyone's talking about and talking about what he's done. And uh, verse 18, it says, uh, chapter 12, verse 18, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign about Lazarus, went out to meet him and the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now... There were some Greeks among them. That warms the cockles of my heart. (laughs) There were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, a Greek town in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus... At this moment, we have Gentiles coming to Jesus and Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's that moment, as the Gentiles come to Jesus, that the hour for his glory to be revealed has been reached. Grace and truth are about to come to all of us to Jew and Gentile alike. Well, what are grace and truth? What is this smorgasbord that has come to all of us? Well, I think most of us would probably uh, easily answer the first question, what is grace? Uh, We tend to know this, particularly if we're familiar with Ephesians 2. It is God's gift to us. It is unmerited favour. And it's unmerited favour. That's really important. It implies unworthiness. And that's important because of the way John sets us up to think about grace. It comes from the context of Israel and God's continual grace to this nation that went perpetually astray from the law that he gave them through Moses. Now, the law was good. The law was holy, as Paul says in the New Testament, uh, in Romans 7. The law is good, it's holy. Uh, It gave Israel the mind of God for shaping their society, gave them good um, uh, customs and norms and regulations and standards. And so we shouldn't see the law as a bad thing. I think sometimes we, uh, we tend to see law as the opposite of grace or law as the opposite of gospel. Sometimes we even characterise being non-Christian as being under law. But no, that's not what it means to be under law. To be under the law means to be a part of Israel, the covenant nation of God in the Old Testament and to have those customs and laws and um, norms apply to you. The law wasn't negative. It was actually a good thing. But the law was limited in what it could do. 
I remember my first car. It was a tiny little Suzuki hatch, 250cc motor. It's basically a lawnmower. <laughs> the tyres were basically boat trailer tyres. It had two seats, four speed, three cylinders. It struggled to go up hills. I remember I was uh, dating my now wife, Kula, at the time, and she lived at the top of a really steep hill. <laughs> and I had to get a run-up in this car to get up there. And so I would get up to, oh, I reckon, 71 kilometres an hour. Yes, the limit was 60 back then. But as soon as it hit the hill, it just wouldn't go fast. It just dropped down. And so I was dropping down through the gears, and eventually crawling up at about 20 k's an hour with cars honking me from behind. Um, it, but it wasn't a bad car. It was a, I really liked it. It was really good. It, it wasn't a dud. It got me through, through uni. It was fantastic, I thought. But it couldn't do much. You know, like going down the freeway was a bit of a problem. I made to make sure that I was tucked in behind trucks because if I got out from, the, from behind the, uh, the uh, wind, the wind break, then oh, the car would just shake. Um, the previous owner told me, actually, that if you take it onto the freeway, put sandbags in the boot. <laughs> so it could only do so much. Uh, I couldn't carry much. I could only carry one passenger and, uh, you know, I couldn't tow anything. The law was a bit like that. It was good. It went places, but it couldn't do everything. It couldn't allow, let the uh, Israelites overcome sin. It could tell them what sin was, but it couldn't implant within their heart the desire to shun sin. As Jeremiah puts it, the sin, the, sorry, the law was written on stone. It wasn't written on the heart. And he looked forward to a time when the law would be written on the heart, when people would desire to know God and not to sin. The law had no more power to make an Israelite stop sinning than the 2022 student handbook has to help you like essays <laughs> or the Greek one syllabus document has the power for you to love Greek and remember paradigms tells you to do them. Jeremiah looked for a new covenant and Israel was shown grace in Jesus Christ. But so were the Gentiles. And this is the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus. He comes to Israel, but in blessing Israel, he has blessed all the nations and that, nation, that blessing has overflowed down through time to us here today in Australia in the 21st century. God has given grace to us who fail to live as he desires, who still struggle with sin. But it's grace and truth that have come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you can't really appreciate grace unless you understand the truth of the human condition. Truth reveals just how bad things are. In John, grace becomes more important because Jesus comes and he shines the light of truth onto, firstly, Israel's condition, but then in doing so, onto the whole human condition. And so the truth of the situation shows us just how go good God is in loving us. He loves us despite ourselves. He doesn't love us for who we are. He loves us despite who we are and what we have become. I think many people, uh, especially these days, make the mistake of thinking that God's grace is simply an affirmation of who we are. So whoever you are, whatever your situation is, whatever situation you happen to be in, that's okay, 
God approves of you and your situation. But that's not what grace is. Grace comes to us in truth. To think that way, that God loves us for who we are, is to say it's a bit like a parent with a sick child telling the child how much that child is loved, but then doing nothing about the child's sickness. The all-affirming God, who is all motherhood and apple pie, is actually not a gracious God. He's not a God who does something. He's not a God who would appraise the truth of the situation and intervene to do something. That God who affirms everyone and everything is actually a neglectful God who lacks both love and justice. That's a God not of grace and truth but a God of apathy and fantasy. We've just elected a new government here in Australia. Imagine if our government leaders made decisions, laws and policies in that way, that simply affirmed the way everything just is. They would never discern problems. They would simply affirm what was already there. That is a completely ineffective way of leading. And that leads to disaster. What we see in Jesus is someone who comes and shows us the truth of where humanity lies before a God who is just, but who also does love. We have all become recipients of God's grace and truth. We have a God who cares so deeply about our human situation that he himself entered it and through that has exposed the reality of our situation. But in doing so, has graciously reached out to us and brought about real change. We have a God who has given us grace and truth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for, he, for him who was eternally with you throughout all ages in the beginning who took on flesh, who became one of us, experienced our life, experienced our lot. We thank you that we have truth revealed to us in him, that he has made, your, made you known to us, that he has made our situation known to us before you. And we thank you so much for the grace that we have received from him. Father, would you compel us by your love to continue to live in this grace and in this truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.